The VIC-20 was uh, a very credible platform, but it was just about to be overtaken by Commodore 64. And that was such a better piece of kit. Are you keeping up with the Commodore? Because the Commodore is keeping up with you. In a world of fun and fantasy, and ever-changing views, and computer terminology, Commodore's news. The Commodore had just come out, and that was advertised as having this you know, a lot of memory and it had a sound chip and I thought, well, that looks like something a bit more interesting than these other machines. So that's what I decided to get. But the Commodore 64 was just so much more tempting because it had that wonderful sound chip in it and had hardware sprites and all the stuff that made your life as a game programmer much easier. It had dedicated graphics, dedicated sound, great processor, sensible interrupt structure, loved it. The, the scrolling, the way everything moved around the screen was a lot more smoother and also you could have more than two colours per character square but you did have these little bit blocky graphics that made it look a bit rubbish. The Spectrum owners obviously always used to sort of mock how the Commodore 64's graphics were much chunkier because in multicolour mode you know the pixels were twice as wide as they were high but then programmers started doing tricks by using the hardware sprites you could put high-res monocolour sprites on top of other ones to get multicolour ones and all I could go into that. There's some. Um, yes. Oh, God. I'm going all nostalgic and dreamy eyed now. There was a, a very booming Commodore 64 tech thing where people would like somehow put sprites in the border. Uh, sprites in the border was, was, was done by utilising a timing bug basically in the, in, in the graphics chip. The people that built the Commodore weren't aware of the fact that it was possible to do this, you know, that you could stretch the whole screen to the width of the TV. So that's the kind of thing that was found by, by hacking. Rather than nicely programming the thing, as you say, following the manual, it's, it's, the, it's exploring and hacking it and, 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 and seeing how we could, I don't want to say the word, but mess it up, you know? It wasn't just a case of writing another game, it's how much could you squeeze out of this processor? You know, we're looking at an 8-bit machine at 0 0.7 megahertz and 64K of RAM. And we made that thing sing, you know, dance, doing stuff that even Commodore, the manufacturers, just couldn't believe. The SID chip, as we all know, is the heart of the, the, heart of the Commodore 64. Who cares about the other stuff? I think the SID chip allowed the Commodore 64 to become an instrument in its own right. And so now the sound wasn't just primitive beeps, there was proper soundtracks that were really, you wanted to listen to them. You would want to find out who had written the music to the latest game and that would be a reason to buy it. The Commodore 64 came along with, with three voices synthesised and, and you could, it was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a complete, it was a cheap synthesiser as far as I was concerned. Uh, and, and, and I could compose for it. It was, it was marvellous. It had um, pulse width and ring modulation. Things you'd expect on a, an actual commercial synthesizer, uh, you know, like a Moog or something. Um, and it gave you so much power, it was unbelievable. And it took me a while to get used to all the sort of features on the SID chips because it's a very sophisticated uh, piece of hardware. Well, there were certain things on the SID chip that you could do, like the, the hard sync and the ring modulation, which is something that I knew about because I'd worked with since. There were a few other, other things that you could do that weren't documented and you would just set a couple of bits and get a, a strange new waveform coming from it. And then I expanded it to try to use it musically, which uh, that was quite a challenge because with it being um, a non-maskable in interrupt, there was only a certain, you know, short range you could do with it to change the actual pitch of what you were getting out of it. had uh, sort of developed this technique for making it sound like the Commodore was playing more than three notes at once by 
taking one of the oscillators and going around the notes I wanted to play in a cycle very quickly, like very fast arpeggio. Because I was into Jean-Michel Jarre and all these other synthesizer racks and one of the tricks I used was arpeggios or arpeggiators all the time to play all these cycles of notes and that sounded really cool to me. So I made the Commodore do it really quickly and when you go really quickly it sounded like all of the notes were being played at once except there was kind of a wibbly wobbly phasey weirdness to the sound. <laughs> had their own kind of little driver routines that would do have various ways of doing kind of you know interesting effects and things um, and that was yes that, that's when it became really fun was 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 pushing the chip further than it, the, further than it would go as it were we were about trying to make a very simple machine look fabulous sound fabulous suck people in and I think going back to what you said about why are people so uh, in love uh, with Commodore 64 music is because they were sucked in, and we, 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 that's what we did. We, we sucked people into a, a, a world that was really little square blocks and very crude sound, really. Yeah. 